we do this together, and it's much better than doing it alone. So we need each other's presence and comfort. We need each other's peace to be bestowed upon one another. And when there is heavy hearts or a sense of emptiness where somebody is missing, we need to be able to bear one another's sorrows and griefs. But we also want to remember and to give thanks and honor and pay tribute to this one who's been taken. And of course, we need also to give thanks to God. He is the author of life and the giver of eternal life. He is our hope and our salvation. And we also need to be understanding that we are asked to prepare to live the rest of the days God gives us in an honorable way, in accordance with God's will. From John's Gospel, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and now has come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. We're going to provide a moment now for family members to share words of memory and tribute. And so we'll look to you, Shar, to begin.
Speaking of being supportive, I do remember a very cold, rainy football game that even I, as a parent, had a hard time being at. It was, it was cold. And John said, do you think your parents are coming? Because they always did. And I said, I, I doubt it. I said, no. You know, my dad was used to the cold, wet weather because of hunting, but, you know, not my mom. So I was like, I, I don't think they're coming. Well, I'm in the stands, and I look, I look out, and here comes my mom wearing my dad's hunting rain gear <laughs> in orange hunting rain gear, which just happened to be Palmyra's color. So <laughs> My dad's passing was hard on my mom, and uh, she insisted on staying in her house, as she should. So we as a family, you know, took care of her and, and kept her there. Um, that was when I talked to Kevin on the phone every day, every single day. <laughs> One day at a time, no regrets, right? Yep. Um, so we were all still working, and, you know, we needed, we needed some help. Couldn't do it all on our own, so I, you know, I prayed about it because I, you know, I didn't know what to do because we did want her to stay in our house, and that's when God answered with um, a business called Our Daughters Love from our church. Um, they were, we were new to that church too, so it was a blessing that we found them. Um, their names were Kelly and Tracy, and they took care of my mom and they loved her as if she were their mom, and we're very appreciative of that. Um, this past February, my mom fell in, in her house and broke her hip. And this changed things. We ended up moving her to a beautiful place, Harmony of Hershey. And there were good caregivers there, too. We had Jackie and Kadisha and Javetta and Kaylee and Charlene, which was her favorite. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, in closing, I'll share one more story. Um, this past July, we got her to Trent's wedding, which was a blessing, and last October to Matt's wedding, um, where she was still very mobile and danced the night away. John requested in her honor a song called on Eileen, and she danced and loved it. It was a great memory for us. So after she passed, I, I knew in my heart that she was healthy and happy and with my dad in heaven. But selfishly, I still prayed for a sign. Just I needed, I just wanted something. So the next day, after taking care of things at the funeral, an old hand picked me up to go get some lunch. And as soon as I got in the car, I saw on the radio display the song, Come On My Lean. And I was so shocked, and I pointed it out to Ann, and I said, Ann, do you see that? She's like, what? And she turned it up, and Come On My Lean was playing for us in the car. So that was an amazing sign, and I thank you for that. Um, later that same day, Owen brought home a coloring picture from school, and it was a big chicken. He just randomly had a chicken that day. Um, Kevin saw the male and the female cardinal at his house together. And then finally, Owen saw a rainbow, and he was sure and thought that's how Nana would get to heaven. So for him to see that rainbow was a blessing. Even without these signs, because of my faith, I know that they are reunited in heaven and we'll all be together in heaven one day. But until then, Mom, I'll miss you. Rest in peace with God, and I love you forever. Sharp.
she's a lady who she enjoyed being a mother and, and, and a good wife. So, uh, with uh, <clears throat> I will say, um, They had wonderful things to say, some of which was one year said, I don't want to repeat it, but um, Eileen was a wonderful and loving wife, mother, mother-in-law, grandmother, great grandmother, friend, relative, you name it, she was. And what John said, and it's ironic, because that's one of the things I remember is her smacking him all the time, saying, John, because he teased her, <laughs> but she loved it. And so we always got a good laugh from that. But family meant everything to her. And she enjoyed all the family get-togethers. She enjoyed going to all these, on all these trips, vacations, um, seeing her grandsons uh, play sports, Kevin and John, all the tournaments, the softball tournaments. Those are the memories that I'm always going to cherish is all our get-togethers that we have. Because in life, it's about your experiences that you have. That's what you remember the most. And I'll always remember her laugh, the way she loved her family. And John said another good thing is true. Um, you know, you hear about in-law jokes or people saying they don't get along with their in-laws. I got along great with Chef and I laid my entire time with them. And I'm always going to appreciate that. And then lastly, she's where she's always wanted to be with Chef. And we love and miss you both. Said, you know, my father passed uh, three years ago, and we said then he was the one that held the family together. But it was my mom that was the love and caring that kept us together and took care of us all. And uh, she was so. She never went to college, but she was so common sense smart. She just always knew what to do in a crisis. She was so good, she never panicked. She never got hysterical. I mean, there were a lot of things she had to take care of. You know, the three of us, Kevin was always getting her. <laughs> I got her. And I'll just tell a little story that illustrates this point. It was the spring of 1970, and I was 13, I was in eighth grade, which was called junior high back then, and I was on the wrestling team. And the season had just ended with a, with a tournament, and my mom and dad came to watch me wrestle, and they took pictures. 
Well, they took slides. They were into taking slides back then. And we had a Kodak carousel slide projector and a portable screen at home. <coughs> so, and then, so I came home in the spring one day, and she said, Barry, the new slides are ready. So I immediately put the slides in a new carousel tray and set up the projector and the screen. And it was now about 4 o'clock, and my dad would be home. He always got home at 5, and we always had supper uh, right after that. So while I was setting up, she started supper in the kitchen, and she had oil heating up in a pan on the stove. And I guess Char and Kevin had come home from school and gone out again already. So it was just me and Mom. And she took a break to come in and look at the slides when I said they were ready. And she wasn't in there long looking with, you know, with me at the slides. And then all of a sudden, we saw smoke pouring out of the kitchen. And we went running in, and the pan was on fire, and the flames were shooting like a foot and a half up in the air. I mean, it was... So my mom grabs the handle of the pan and throws it in the sink. And she was smart enough not to run water on it because water on a grease fire, that would have exploded everywhere. So she started pulling dish towels out of a drawer and she shouted instructions at me, Barry, call the fire department because by then the flames had set the curtains on fire above the sink. And back then everything was extremely flammable and they just went up fast, headed toward the ceiling. And she's Barry, call the fire department. Well, I just froze. I couldn't do a thing. I was frozen in horror watching this. And the only thought going through my head was, the house is going to burn down. And it probably would have. Uh, it was up to me. But she had her wits about her. She, she wet a towel, and first she threw it on the pan and put that fire out. But the curtains were really burning getting close to the ceiling. She goes, Barry, run next door and see if they have a fire extinguisher. Again, I couldn't move. I was just frozen. I couldn't, I couldn't move a muscle. So my mom pulls a cucumber. She wets another towel. And I don't know how she did it because she wasn't very tall. But she managed to slap the fire out on the curtain right as it reached the ceiling. And I'm telling you, she saved the day. That, it, Probably would have burned down if it was up to me, you know. I didn't do a thing. <laughs> and a little while later, my dad gets home, and the kitchen was a mess. There was smoke everywhere, and there was soot all over the wall and the ceiling. He was just happy. Put your feet. You're running off the back of it. Oh. <laughs> Put your feet. Um, he was just happy that the house was still standing. And uh, needless to say, our supper was a little burnt that night. <laughs> but uh, that just showed how she was in a crisis. She was just calm, she never panicked, and she just did, she always knew what to do, and she did it. And uh, like Charlene said, we, we had such wonderful role models. You know, our parents married for 65 years. We never had a move, we never had to change schools. We grew up in a great neighborhood with great people and great friends. And our friends liked to come to play at our house because my mom was always friendly to them. She was one of the nice moms in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to miss her so much. She, uh, um, we'll never forget my mom and dad. They will always be in our hearts and in our memories. And I'm glad, you know, that she's in heaven now with my dad. That's where she needed to be. Um, she had a hard time after he passed. And uh, I love you, Mom and Dad.
take a few moments for others to share something if you wish. If you've got a strong voice, you can stand where you are. If you don't have one, maybe you ought to come up and use the mic. Anyone? Very good. A scripture from the Apostle Paul. Brothers and sisters, so in a sense I would have you understand he's addressing you in this room today. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. And with a loud command, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive, and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. In my few thoughts, in a meditation sense, I would have you to reflect on three promises that kind of arise out of that scripture, but promises for those who put their faith in Christ. We are built upon a foundation of the scriptures, of life that is authored by God, death which is the destiny of every human, but then eternal life which is the blessing of God forever and ever. So Christians believe in the resurrection. Death is not the end. It is a necessary doorstep, I suppose, but it is not the end. And by faith, we have new life. So I want to suggest three promises that God gives us. The first of these is, even now, we therefore believe and are promised a participation in the victory of God over death. Jesus was laid in a tomb. A stone was rolled over the entrance. And yet that tomb is empty, and he promises that to us too. Because he lives, we also shall live. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. From Romans chapter 8, Jesus Christ, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you hear it? Even now... Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God the Father, interceding on my behalf and on your behalf. For your families, for those who have faith. And so who will separate us? It's a rhetorical question. It isn't insisting on an answer because we know the answer. No one can separate us from the love of Christ. There is... The scripture says, no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus. Even the worst among us, like the thief on the cross, 
at the side of Jesus at his own crucifixion, is by faith promised paradise. Forgive The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's promise number one. Victory over the grave. The second promise, because of Jesus and the resurrection, we can gather like this here today and have genuine hope and joy. Oh yes, there's grief, there's sadness, there are some tears. That's a part of it. But with the confidence that he gives us, our hope is in the resurrection. Jesus has a friend, called a good friend, named Lazarus. He was the brother of sisters named Mary and Martha. Word comes to Jesus that Lazarus is sick with an appeal that he come. He delays his going to the home to be with Lazarus and to be with Mary and Martha. And in that delay, Lazarus dies. And in due time, Jesus says to his disciples, let us go the home, to the family. There are objections, there's danger, there is persecutions, there are threats. But he says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and I'm going there to wake him up. The disciples say to Jesus, well, if he sleeps, he'll be better. And so they misunderstand. Jesus corrects them and says, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. He did it intentionally. And in due time they arrive, and upon his arrival, both of the sisters say to him at different times, but they say to him, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And they're in that intersection between grief and hope, tears and joy. Lord, if you had been here. To Martha, he says, your brother will rise again. And she knows the right answer. Yes, I know, at the last day, on judgment day, I know he will rise. But Jesus interrupts. Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, and those who, whoever believes and lives in me will never die. Do you believe this? And Martha says, yes, Lord. Twice the story says that Jesus was deeply moved, once with the mourners, and then once at the tomb where the stone has been laid in front of the, of the tomb. It was a moment of great anxiety, fear even, Drama for certain. He orders the tomb to be open. Lazarus has been laid there for four days. But he says to them, Did I not tell you, if you believe, you would see the glory of God? And he raises his voice and says, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man comes out. And Jesus instructs the bystanders, Take off his grave clothes. <clears throat> and let him go. The joy we know at a Christian funeral is that at God's time and in God's way, you can expect to hear God say to you and to me, Vern, come out. It's time. So with faith and expectation, we move on to the third promise, the promise that because of Jesus and the resurrection, you, me, no one is ever, ever alone. He lives with us. Jesus' final words to his disciples before he was taken up from this earthly life into the presence of God the Father Almighty. He says to them, Surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. No matter how difficult things are, or what circumstances we find ourselves in, we are never, ever alone. I leave you with this 
scripture. It's from the Apostle Peter. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power, until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this all of you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These come so that our faith may be proven genuine, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, and that it might result in the praise, the glory, and the honor when Jesus is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let us pray. Our God, we thank you for the faith that you offer to us, that if we put our trust in you, we have a home, an eternal home. And we will have one day a great reunion, like this family will have with the loved ones lost. And we anticipate that, that we aren't left to our own um, meager end of what we might call life. We are left with a promise, a hope, a salvation that abides forever and ever. So Lord, in our moments of loneliness, in our moments of absence from those who've been such a special part of our lives, Fill that absence, that void with your presence, your love, your Holy Spirit, bringing us peace and salvation. To that end, we pray today for all of us, but Lord, especially this family. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This concludes our service here. And again, as I said earlier, you're welcome to go to the graveside at Woodlawn. A lunch to follow at What If, and if you want to go directly from here to What If, you are welcome to do that. We'll turn it over to the, to the directors at this time. <laughs>